One, two, three. Boom, bow, bow, go, bow. Let me tell you how it will be. <laughs> Sorry, wrong show. Wrong show. I digress. Digress. Hey, it's episode five, six. It is six. episode five. Oh, fuck me. It is episode five. <laughs> it's been a long day, guys. Hey, what's going on? Let's it's, go, guys. of course, Andy and my boy, Rob. I'm in a goofy mood today. Yeah, that's okay. It's good. It's the last episode, you know, at least of well, this series. You know, it's the last episode. Uh, just got off of doing two days of parent uh, teacher conferences where mm-hmm. I had to be at my most adult 48 oh, hours so now i'm just like i'm done it's a- tomorrow is a normal day again the kids come back so now i'm like extra goofy to compensate <laughs> for my for my adulting these past two days well, but how you doing buddy hopefully i was gonna say hopefully it will make for an entertaining episode and i'm doing good i tomorrow's my last day of work for till the weekend i'm chill ready to talk king crimson again as always <laughs> Ready to talk about all things King Crimson, and uh, this is a little bittersweet because this is going to be, at least for a while, the last time we really talk about King Crimson. I'm a little sad about it, and um, do you mind if I open uh, <clears throat> open this with something? Do it. So, I think that this was definitely, as we said, the perfect band to start this off with, and it's been just a wild ride, you know? I mean, we both... It was, this was always a band that you and I bonded over, you know. There's probably a couple other ones I could think of, but I think King Crimson was the big one. So for us to even, you know, reconnect and then, you know, in the first place and then start this podcast and start, start it by doing King Crimson. It's like old times, man. I've been really enjoying it, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's And it's, it's funny that you say that because I, you know, I totally did it that. This was definitely, mm-hmm. um, you and I go, you know, back a long time and this... Um, this has always been a band, like you said, that we have both just mutually have shared a love for, mm-hmm. and it's been great to go back and revisit the band's catalog, dive into albums that, you know, I had never listened to or just wasn't mm-hmm. as familiar with, and I know you feel the same. It was great having discussions about the band with you mm-hmm. that we haven't had. I always, you know, maybe prior we always talked more about certain albums, and it was great to, like, really just dive deep and discuss the whole catalog with you i agree um and just even during this experience recording the show um you know i got to see king crimson live just a few weeks ago which we're going to talk about in a minute Mm -hmm. um so it's 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 really bittersweet man but you know of course behind the scenes you know we'll continue to always talk about this band but um you know, with that being said, I'm really looking forward to moving on to the next series. I was well. about to say the same thing. I'm definitely looking forward to moving on. And uh, I feel like I've definitely, like, I feel fine. Like, now if I talk to somebody about King Crimson, I could say, yes, I, I have very thoroughly <laughs> gone through this band's career. <laughs> and I think I know a, a few things, at least about the studio stuff. But Yeah, yeah same. And, and, and I think as a result that, you know, they've kind of, now have gone further up in terms of my favorite bands you know Same. this is always a favorite band of mine but i think now um i've just i've become a bigger fan which i didn't realize was possible but mm-hmm. guess what it is so let's let's do this rob let's kind of just give a quick overview of what the format of today's show is going to be sure. and then uh, we'll get right into it all right why don't you go for it you got the notes man sure so we are going to start out in a couple minutes uh we're going to go into um king crimson live uh i just said i recently saw king crimson a few weeks ago in dc and you saw him a couple years ago so we're gonna uh, believe it or not almost two years ago i saw him in november of 2017 oh no kidding all right so that's perfect two two years apart so we're going to talk about both of our you know um our live experiences with kc and uh compare set lists uh so after we do that then we're going to uh do our album rankings our individual album rankings uh, that's gonna then follow with each of our individual top 20 uh king crimson songs um somehow and this should, <laughs> this should be interesting but we're gonna take both of our top 20s and put together a mutual top 20 king crimson list mm-hmm. song list uh and then we're gonna end the show uh rob came up with a few questions and we're gonna 
both answer those and also just talk about three tracks uh, throughout the catalog that maybe at the time we weren't as keen about that have grown on us since. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to be the show, guys. Um, Of course, before we end, we are going to kind of just talk about the new format that we briefly mentioned in the last episode, as well as reveal the next artist. Were we going to talk about any of, like, were we going to brush over any of the stuff that we hadn't talked about? Um, You know, basically, all like, and like, just brush over the material of theirs that wasn't the studio albums. Um. Yeah. You know, we can do that when we talk about um, both the concerts we went to, because I think that's a okay uh, good transition there. Why don't we get started? Talk about your show first. Sure. Um. I saw them in 2017, and um, like I said, I saw them in November. I saw them at the Beacon Theater in New York City, and uh, it was phenomenal. I mean, uh, as far as I, I can honestly say, they were the most technically impressive band that I've ever seen. And just to throw a couple names out there of bands I've seen, Yes, um, Jethro Tull, uh, Zappa Play Zappa, uh, Rush, um, Iron Maiden, I mean, some like really musically very talented bands uh king crimson i think by far surpassed all of them even a band like rush who i've always thought was were some of the the most talented musicians in rock i think king crimson just i can't think of a band that's that's more musically (coughs) impressive you know so yeah and i was just thinking as you were listing some of those other bands Mm -hmm. um i too have seen all those other bands live Mm -hmm. Uh, that you just mentioned um and i would have to agree i would say in terms of just you know playing and proficiency um i would say maybe the closest that would rival are um zappa play zappa or even i saw return of forever yeah um, long time ago but that that might be you know at the same caliber just in terms of just sheer musicianship and that of course doesn't take away from any other band or artist I've seen live. Not but. at all. I mean, that's I mean that's a big statement I think on King Crimson to say that they are better than all. At least as far as I'm concerned, they were better musically than all of those bands. You know, because they're, totally, yeah. they're all very very impressive musically. But uh, aside from just the musicality part of it, um, the uh, I you know I don't know about you, but we sounds like we both had similar set lists. Um, and it's interesting with King Crimson because they're one of the only bands these days that I can think of that they don't do the exact same set list every night. I think they, at least the current lineup of King Crimson have been pulling from a larger pool of songs. Um, So they'll, you know, they'll change it up pretty much every night, which is exciting, you know, but also in a way, sometimes a bummer because like if you're like me and you look at set lists beforehand, you'll see a song and you'll be like, oh my God, I hope they play that song. And you know, maybe they don't play it, but uh, I have to say they played, I don't have the set list in front of me, but, uh, just some of the tracks that they played. They played, um, they played some a lizard. Uh, they played a bunch of stuff off of Red. They played Red. They played Starless, which was by far the highlight of the show um, for me. It was just gave me goosebumps. Um, they played really a, a kind of like a like I said, as close to a best of King Crimson that I could think of. And um, I don't know. I was impressed with the. The drummers, the sound was really good. Uh, a lot of people say, what do you need four drummers for? But I felt like they really filled it well. Um, That's right. You saw them when there was four drummers. Yes, on. I did. Um, the lineup I just saw, they were uh, back down to three drummers. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was just, I, I don't really know what else to say. I, I really couldn't keep my eye, eyes off of Tony Levin, to be honest with you, because that guy <laughs> is just a machine. <laughs> and, uh, and also uh, Mel Collins, too, did some really good stuff um, it was so cool to see mel collins yeah in this lineup of the band the only way it could have possibly been better as far as i'm concerned is if adrian blue were there um yeah i agree and that's a conversation you and i have had um um behind the mic um that it would be cool if uh you know while still keeping jacko in the band and him doing vocals for some of the more earlier stuff like from court to red but have adrian Ballou singing everything from discipline on Mm -hmm. um and then to have you know three of the best guitar players in one band just because i mean jacko definitely oh yeah you know you got to give that guy credit as far as you know uh sitting right next to fred every night who is just a guitar god 
Um, you know, that, that guy is, you know, no joke either on the guitar. So to have the three of them would be really cool. Oh, absolutely. And um, the drummers were all amazing too. Like um, you have, you had a, quite a few powerhouses there. Uh, I really like Pat Mastoletto myself, but they were all really good. And um, I don't know. Oh, Islands was another highlight for me. That was a really, really awesome part of the show. Um, yeah, that was one of my favorite moments too mm-hmm. when they played Islands. And, and of Epitaph, course, that's just, of course. Was another one. Epitaph. Um, you said they played Lizard. Do you remember what parts of Lizard? Because from when I saw them, they played just the Dawn song section. It was actually Dawn song. And then, um, uh, what is it? The Battle of Glass Tears, I think, I think is after that. They played something similar to that. It wasn't the whole piece, but they played. They definitely played sections of it. That sounds about right. And they played Circus too. I'm pretty sure, which is pretty cool. Yeah, they uh, they played Circus. They actually, they opened with Circus mm-hmm. when I saw them. I what was interesting when I saw them. You want to talk about two totally like different songs from different eras of the band that they played back to back. Um, so they opened up with the three drummers, um, mm-hmm. just like doing this drum solo thing together in unison. Um, I don't even know really how else to describe that. Um, but they <laughs> then went into Circus, and then right after Circus, they played Neurotica, which is, again, <laughs> two completely different songs, but somehow it worked just hearing those back to back. I can honestly say I, I, I think this is one of the best lineups of the band, uh, and I don't, I really, there's, Maybe I'm biased because I saw them live, but they are incredible. I would like to see at least one more King Crimson album with this lineup of the band. That would be interesting enough. This is um, the longest going lineup. However, what's kind of ironic about that is it's while the longest um, lineup to date, <laughs> they have not recorded a studio album. The closest so... thing we got was the. Um... A scarcity of miracles the jacko and... so that i don't count for yeah. two reasons one that's considered more project now yeah. that played a huge role in resurrecting king crimson again mm-hmm. but also that has i'm trying to think of course frip um it's frip uh it was frip gavin harrison jacko and mel collins and i think just mel collins i don't mm-hmm. i don't even think tony levin i could be wrong but I, i'm pretty sure tony levin's not on it yeah um, as well as Pat Mastelato, of course. Um, but that, that project definitely had a huge role in bringing King mm. Crimson back. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, I, as far as the concert goes, I don't really have much to say. The only thing I, I want to say, I'll say on air here, is that a lot of people don't know, is we always talked about going to see King Crimson together. I would like to see them at least one more time, and I think we should try to go see them together. I would too. I'm going to be honest with you, especially since um, this was a 50th anniversary tour, which just mm-hmm. wrapped up, by the way. Um, while I'm not ruling out the possibility that they'll still play more shows, I, I, I don't think there's going to be an opportunity to see them again. We I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. By all means, I hope I'm wrong. Just, just the fact that I was finally able to see them uh, once yeah. is satisfying enough for me. Same. Again, I would love to see them, and if I'm going to see them again, it better be with you there. Oh, definitely, yeah. If, but if, I just, I don't know. I just got this feeling it's not going to happen again. It, I think if it, I, I could see where you're coming from, and if if it if it doesn't, I agree. I'm just happy I got to see them. But uh, if if they do tour, you know, within the next couple of years or something, we're looking at, I think, probably the tail end of their their touring days because i mean it's not like a lot of these guys aren't are getting much younger you know but if they tour again i would love to go see them with you so if they announce another tour we'll keep our eyes out and we should try to see them together i'm game I'm especially totally if adrian blue is there i'm going to see him like if adrian blue because he's apparently like an like an inactive member right now so if he suddenly they're like hey we're gonna do a tour but adrian blue is joining us it's like you bet we are jumping on tickets <laughs> <laughs> definitely uh, so i i have my set list pulled up in front of me okay so i'm, I'm gonna go ahead and just um quickly read it to you and just share a few um thoughts okay uh, of certain songs and then we'll move on okay um so as i said before their first set they opened up uh, i guess it's called on the set list drum sins mm-hmm. where uh the three drummers came out and just did this drum uh duet thing it was really cool mm-hmm. um and that went into circus and while circus isn't one of my favorite king crimson songs um this particular version live was great jacko 
sounded fantastic on vocals, uh, and I thought it suited as a great opener as well mm. for the concert. Uh, so after Circus, we went into Neurotica, which is one of my favorite KC songs. Um, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, but then that went into a track that I'm not too familiar with, uh, Suitable Grounds for the Blues. This is a song that I guess this current lineup recorded, and there's not a studio recording of it, but it does appear on some of the more recent albums. So I'm not really too familiar with it, but, you know, it was cool. It's definitely a song along with a couple other songs um, that I got to go back and listen to. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then after that, that went into Red, and of course that was just amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, They played that at my show too. It was fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, and then Red, they went into Moonchild, which is the first two minutes I love, and you know my feelings about the rest of the track, but they did something a little different. Um, Tony Levin kind of like did his own... um, on the Chapman stick uh, for a pen of solo as well. Uh, and it was really cool. I wish that was on the original recording, but it's not. But nonetheless, it was it was still cool hearing that song live. Uh, then we got Cat Food, which um, Cat Food I'm going to talk about a little more later because uh, I've expressed my feelings about that song before. <laughs> but I'm not going to lie, it was cool hearing it live. So I, I, I enjoyed it. My brother and I, I went to see King Crimson with my brother. My brother and I just looked at each other and started laughing when <laughs> <laughs> that song started. But it, it was it was cool to hear it live. Nice. Um, then it went into, on the set list, it's listed as Drumzilla. <laughs> uh, so that was just really, again, more drum solos. That was neat. Uh, then we went into Frame by Frame, and this was cool to hear. Um, this was one of the songs that they slightly altered the lyrics a little bit, and I'm not really too sure why, but um, it was cool. I mean, you know, Adrian Ballou is hard to, you know, try to impersonate. And this is where, while I love Jacko, this is where, you know, I agree with you. It'd be really oh, yeah. good to have adrian blue only adrian blue in my opinion can really sing those songs at their best but it was still cool to hear frame by frame um and then the first set closed with electric which was kick-ass to hear great and then yeah and then closed with epitaph which i mean that of course was a highlight (laughs) oh yeah Uh, that song always is (laughs) yeah so then set two went into um this has a less uh, listed drum sins again and if i do recall um, I believe it, the second set did start with the drummer again. Um, then it went into Dawn Song from the Lizard Suite, mm-hmm. uh, which Great. that was cool to hear. Uh, then Lark's Tongues in Aspect Part 4. Uh, then Islands, which was another highlight for me. Uh, boy, did the place get really quiet when they played that. And then Islands was, this was another cool transition. From Islands, we go to Easy Money, which <laughs> couldn't be more of just like a thumping kick-ass track which they also altered the lyrics to just a tad bit um then after easy money we went to the construction of light which that was also cool to hear because that's a song uh, that's my favorite off that record i'm jealous of that although again that's another one where i would definitely prefer to have adrian blue um on vocals but i'm sure he probably did. out of all of the adrian blue songs this one worked the best with mm-hmm. gecko's vocals in my opinion at least uh, but i agree of course it would be better to hear Adrian sing it. But it was still good. It was another highlight uh, for me that night. Then we go into Starless, and oh, God. I I should go without saying that that was the highlight of the night. But I loved when, you know, the breakdown at the end with Mel Collins, Fripp, um, and the drums. Uh, the like, did this happen when the lights started turning red? And yeah, that same thing yeah. happened on my show. That was so that, cool. That was so cool. Um, and not that like you know, King Crimson's a band, and they didn't other than that song really needs added production. But I'm not gonna lie, it was it was a cool effect for that song in particular. Uh, so then after Starless, we went into Indiscipline. I've kind of talked about my feelings about Jacko's approach to this song, especially since one of my favorite King Crimson songs. Um, I was happy they played it, but uh, it's just weird that it sounds, the vocals sound more doo-woppy to me. Yeah, he kind of tries to sing the song and it's spoken word, it, so it doesn't really It's work. spoken word and it, it just, it doesn't work, but it's it's fine. Um, and then they close set to you with uh, the Court of the Crimson King, which 
of course, was another highlight. Oh, of course. The encore, of course, was 21st Century Skid Soy Man, which was also fucking fantastic. That's awesome. I actually pulled up my set list, too. Do you want to hear it real quick? Yeah, go for it. I don't, I'm not going to, like, break it down, but okay. Uh, one, Devil Dogs of Tessellation Row. So, some kind of... That's another one of those um, songs that, I guess, the band recorded, like, this current lineup, but there is an official studio recording but yeah go ahead, they, they, they need to get on that pictures of a city <laughs> oh you got pictures in a city yep. lucky uh neurotica which was weird because he didn't do any of the spoken stuff but he just sang the the chorus so there was that circus then lizard and it was the battle of glass tears dawn song last skirmish and prince Rupert or prince rupert's lament okay so they, they actually played a good chunk of lizard epitaph uh radical action two Level five, Starless, Indiscipline. That was set one. It's quite a good first set. The second Ooh, a set. A lot of songs that were in my set two are in your set one. Interesting. Yep. And uh, set two was Hellhounds of Crim, The Letters, which was actually really cool from Islands, um, Breathless, which is actually a, a song from Exposure, which is Robert Fripp's. You hit Robert Fripp's solo album. That's right. Yeah. Moonchild, Court of the Crimson King. Radical action to unseat the hold of a monkey mind, whatever that is. Um, meltdown, Lark's, tongue, Lark's Tongues and Aspic Part 2, Islands, Easy Money, and the encore was 21st Century Schizoid Man. So I didn't do it an exact head count, but there was about four or five songs um, that you got that I didn't, and yeah. of course vice versa. I'll say out of all of them, the one I'm jealous the most of is that you got Lark's Tongues too. <laughs> I'm I'm jealous of constructional light, so there you go. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> All right, so that was that was uh, kind of just an overview of both of our King Crimson um, live uh, experiences, which yeah. were just both amazing. So one thing we wanted to do really quick before we get into our album rankings is kind of just touch base on some of the live albums. Mm-hmm. And guys, I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of these I haven't listened to. Um, some Same. of them that we um, some of them we've talked about in other episodes if they kind of fell into the period that we were discussing. Um, so let's just talk about a few of these really quick. Uh, the first official um, live album that was released that I haven't listened to in years is Earthbound. Mm-hmm. And not there's the video a reason, game, in case anybody not, not the video game. Great but game, there's a but... reason. There's a reason why I haven't listened to Earthbound, and just from what I remember, it just sounds like shit. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Now I was reading up uh, about it a while ago, and apparently, it's kind of developed like its own little cult following, <laughs> partially because of that. I mean, I was like, I was reading online that. People were saying that, like, <laughs> the Earthbound pioneered noise rock. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that I, I have the 30th anniversary edition of it. I've read that the 40th really cleaned it up. So mm-hmm. one of these days, it's one I'm going to go back to. But, um, it, yeah, it's been a long time since I've listened to Earthbound. I've never listened to it. So that's I'll, maybe I'll, it'll be one I crack out sometime. Well, don't make it a priority. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but the, the one I do kind of want to throw out there, and it kills me that it's not, I, like the only one that's not on Spotify. Um, I just recently got the Great Deceiver box set. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, so there's the box set that was originally released in 1991 or two. I don't know my dates in front of me for that. Um, but there is a two CD set that they... Um, just, I guess, released a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, the one has the first two discs, and the other has, of course, the latter two discs. And if you're a fan of the Red Era, I shouldn't even say the Red Era, the, the Wet and Bruford Cross Fripp Era, mm-hmm. um, that's that's the one to get, guys. Um, and I correct myself by not calling it the Red Era because really this is the stuff from the 73 74 era so you're mostly getting um lark stuff starless bible black stuff it was there's a couple red two tours because they never toured red right they never toured for red um yeah. there's a couple red songs uh that they do play that um you can tell that they're 
working out the kings both instrumentally and mm-hmm. lyrically. Um, so of course they were played live before the studio versions, but that is like the stuff to listen to. I mean, the, oh my god, it took me two weeks because I listened to it in my car um, to my commute to work. It took me two weeks to get through the whole set, but. Probably <laughs> top three live albums. <laughs> wow, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to. Like I was saying to you, I'm gonna need to put that on my iPod or something. Or if you know. you're a King Crimson fan, if you're a fan of that era of the band with the improv stuff, so good. Um, I'll tell you some superior versions of certain songs. I mean, um, I think there are better versions of Fracture. Um, on a couple of those discs, as opposed to the uh, Starless and Bible Black version. There's great live versions of Lament, Easy Money, probably the best version of 21st Century Schizoid Man I've ever heard. Wow. Um, there's a couple of versions of Starless, um, while not as good as the final versions, uh, final version off Red. Um, it's interesting to hear um, them kind of working that song out. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the lyric lyrics are out of order like certain lines um are switch around so that's interesting to hear um but yeah uh the great deceiver that's that's like the live king crimson like that is like a great great representation of king crimson live awesome yeah and they have so many live albums i mean god it's you know there's so many live recordings through the dgm uh yeah dgm right website dgm which um i i've been meaning to subscribe to by the way yeah Same. um because i know and i and i always see and i haven't downloaded any of them but i always see on facebook um on the king crimson page um that they do post live tracks from the current tour for free download so that's something i gotta hop on as well too but i have been looking into uh signing up for that because there's there's a lot of stuff that you can just get live just from really their whole career so that's you know that's treasure that's kc treasure as far as i'm concerned yeah (laughs) it'd be interesting to go uh get some tracks from the show i saw if they have any yeah Yeah. totally um so the i'm not gonna go through every live album but the other one i do want to mention that we did talk about on the third episode a little bit is absent lovers Mm -hmm. and this show was recorded live in montreal in 1984 I believe, if memory serves me correctly, it was either one of the last shows from the Discipline era, or it might have actually been the last show. Mm -hmm. But either way, um, I think, like The Great Deceiver, there are some, to me at least, superior versions of some of these songs in love. Um, Specifically tracks from Beat and Three of a Perfect Pair. Um, so I'm just, I'm looking at the set of this one now and it's, it's really like, it covers those three albums and you get some oldies too. Um, there's a live version of red and there's also a live version of, uh, where is it? There it is. Narc's tongues in aspect part two. But, um, that's another one that's worth checking out too, is the absent lovers live. I want to mention, uh, electric live in Japan. There's actually a DVD companion to this. Um, which is the Eyes Wide Open DVD, it looks like. I'm just looking it oh, up that's now. that's right. You, you did talk about that on the last and episode. And that was really, really good. I really liked that. <laughs> so I highly recommend uh, uh, Electric Live in Japan and that DVD as well. Yeah, that's one I got to check out still. All right, cool. So one of the moments... I'll just drop my mic. <laughs> How unprofessional am I? Um, you swine. I know, goddamn swine. Um, <laughs> one of the moments the three of you have been waiting. I'm kidding. Um, that everyone's been waiting for uh, is our album rankings. I guess you could say our top thirteen, since there are thirteen studio yep. albums. So I'm thinking, let's do this. Let's list them in. Reverse order, so starting at your number 13. Okay. So you'll say your number 13, and I'll say my number 13, I like et cetera, this. et cetera. Does that make sense? And and what we're going to do, because we did this with, because we're, we're doing a collective top 20, we're going to do a collective top five albums. 
Oh, we happening? are. Okay. Well, okay, cool. We're doing a collective like, top five. That would be good. And also, yes, uh, this is the moment I've been waiting for. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the moment Paul <laughs> been right. waiting for. And we'll, and we, we, if you want, we can, uh, you can give a, a brief description. I mean, you know, we've, we covered okay. all of these albums in depth, but um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, do you want me to go first? You go first. Number 13 for me is Starless and Bible Black. Oh, my heart. <laughs> no, no. You blew it up. <laughs> Planet all right, number 13. I, I can't say, though, in retrospect, I'm too surprised that you're yeah. number 13. Um, okay, so, well, I'm going to get you back because my number 13 is Lizard. I'm not surprised. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, please, God, no. Um, yeah, I mean, <sighs> look, my opinion really hasn't changed. <laughs> Hey, that's fair. Blizzard. I'm I just, glad you, it, you know, released, it's just, like, a few tracks off of it, though. So. I do, I do. It's just, it's very bloated. It's it's too... I'm not going to get into it, because <laughs> I already covered that in the first episode. But yeah, so, that's my number 13. So, the reason my number 13 is Starless is because... Um, and uh, I want to say, by the way, here, I don't think, like, um, looking at this list, they I don't think, like, King Crimson has a bad album. They have some ones that aren't as good. Like, they have some really great albums. They have some good... And, and even, like, the bottom ones here, I'm kind of like, you know... I'm not a huge fan of, but I will listen to Starless every day before I listen to most modern mu music, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but I think the reason I th that Starless and Bible Black doesn't work for me is because it doesn't feel like a complete album. It feels like, you know, we've talked about how there's certain songs, like, on there, like The Mincer and a few of those, where it's just, like... It seems like it's an unfinished song and there's also just a lot of stuff that's just kind of jammy stuff that you could it, it almost seems like they've just put up put a bunch of stuff that they were working on and hadn't really had a chance to finish and just threw it on an album that isn't to say that there aren't some great songs on the album but um like trio is a great one i love that that um that tune that's a really big highlight actually and a couple others but the the album as a whole just doesn't it just doesn't feel complete in my opinion Fair so. enough. Fair enough. Um, I think those are all valid points that you made that um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll also touch base on um, when I get to where I've ranked that record. Okay. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of continue to, you know, I guess, really, I said I wasn't going to get into it, but um, again, I just, Lizard for me, I just think it's very bloated. Um, mm -hmm. I admire that they were continuing to, you know, progress and um, mm -hmm. further their sound. It definitely in some aspects feels like the next um, logical progression after mm -hmm. coming off of in the court of the Crimson King and in the wake of Poseidon. But um, yeah, I don't know. It just didn't, didn't work for me. Hey, I would, I would, I would say it, it's borderline pretentious. And I think that's uh, really my biggest gripe with it, but there it's, are some hidden gems in it for sure. It seems like one of those albums where you either like it or you just don't you know there's not yeah i think we said that in the first episode too yeah. um it, it's one you like or you don't particularly like there's mm -hmm. no like oh lizard's an okay record yeah <laughs> <laughs> um all right so let's uh go for your number 12 three of a perfect pair three of a perfect pair all yep. right so my number 12 is the construction of life interesting okay um do you want to go first or you want me to go first um why. so i'll just i'll just say that you know going back and listening to it while i still stand by what i said in the last episode i really want to listen to the reconstruction of light mm -hmm. um my so opinions with it are just kind of similar to lizard really it's just um i think again it's very bloated um it does come off borderline pretentious i think what kind of just puts it above lizard more is um, the title track is one of my favorite King Crimson songs mm -hmm. that I'll talk about when we get, um, you know, a little later in the episode. Um, but yeah, I just, similar feelings as Lizard. And I think what puzzles me with this one too is that in between Thrak and the construction of Light, um, they went off and they did these projects um, with the mindset of using that as the basis of where they were going to go with the next studio record mm -hmm. and just just listening to some of um some of the projects which i haven't you know that's like a 
set of pull-ups, so right there. That's a um, project in itself, if you will. You literally, no pun intended. <laughs> um, I, you, just listening, there's some great stuff. So while I, I know that some of it got incorporated with the construction of light, um, I don't know. I just I feel like that with doing that process in between that, in theory, you could have really put out your best record. Um, because the, the, the idea, the concept is brilliant, it really is, but um, the execution just, at least for me, isn't there. And I would say uh, that last point that you made is kind of what uh, applies for me for Three of a Perfect Pair. Like, the concept was really cool, but I think especially the sequencing of the album is pretty, it could be better, and uh, it just feels a little particularly compared to something like Discipline, it's just, it doesn't work too much, but it's still a great album i mean it was kind of hard to to put it that far down i was like wow really that's like my second you know or that's my second least favorite one or whatever but um like by, by no means is it a bad, bad album there's a lot of really good songs on it actually but it just for me doesn't really work too much you know um there's some of the longer pieces definitely get a bit much after a while you, you, I, I feel a lot of fatigue towards the end of the album you know <laughs> yeah that's fair and i and i agree with that too on that record in particular um, okay, your number 11. In the wake of Poseidon. Hey, so we have a tie. Nice. My number 11 is also in the wake of Poseidon. Yeah, uh, I think, I don't, I mean, without, you know, to, without trying to make this really long, you know, going through this thing, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's good. It's just one of the weaker um, earlier, you know, King Crimson albums as far as I'm concerned. And it just, it's not as, again, it has some really, really high spots, but it also has a few low spots as well. Um, for Same. Sure, so. And, you know, it's we're not going to get into the, you know, comparisons with that in core, but I will just say that, you know, for people who um, who are a fan of this record, and, you know, that's that's fine, it's your opinion, but, um, look, I don't think it's better than In the Court of the Crimson King. Mm-hmm. I think um, while it's very similar um, I, I just think the execution that just was better on court. Yeah. I think that due to the success of that record and just how revolutionary it was, and especially that the band was breaking up or actually had broken up. Yeah. Um, they took, I don't want to say the easy route, but they, you know, logically it's like, well, let's try to, you know, recreate what we did on the first one. Um, and whether you do think that or not, um, I think it is there. I think it's valid to feel that way. Um, that it, it's trying to be its, you know, its its older brother. But um, I just think Court is the superior record. Yeah, that's would, that's that's really that by far. And and to be fair to the album, it had a hard act to follow. But even so, it's just the songs weren't as good. You know, it's mm-hmm. as simple as that, in my opinion. You know, it's the there was the songs were better written and better. Uh, for lack of a better term, orchestrated on the first album. And it sucks to maybe compare it to the first album, but it's kind of hard not to, you know. When yeah, and and that's, that's my point exactly. It's, yeah. it's, it's not fair to do so, but how, how can you not? Yeah. Um, your number 10. Construction of Light. Construction of Light. All right. My number 10 is Beat. Interesting. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Construction of Light same, has the same issue as Starless and... Bible Black has, as far as I'm concerned, except that I think the songs do feel, for the most part, more complete, but it has Fractured and um, Construction of Light, the song, which are two of, like, just two amazing songs, two of the best songs from that period of the band, so those automatically, I think, elevate this one for me, but I agree that I, pretty much same sentiments as you, um, with a lot of what you said. <clears throat> yeah, I forgot to mention before too when uh, I revealed my ranking for construction of light. Um, just to put it out there that my feelings have not changed. That Prozac Blues is the worst King Crimson. <laughs> that Fair. opinion has not changed. Fair. Although I do need to check out that live version that you were talking about. Yeah, do that. Um, it's but for particularly on this one, it was good. Yeah, on the uh, the live album I, I mentioned, the electric one. So for me with. Beat being at number 10. Um, Beat, to a degree, has grown on me a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, one of my all-time favorite King Crimson songs is on there. Uh, that, of course, is Neurotica. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are some other 
write tracks on there too. Waiting Man, mm-hmm. um, ugh, the one funky instrumental that I'm blanking on right now. Sep- Tori in Tangier. Yep. The one? yep. Excuse me, that's it. Um, Neil Jack and Me has grown on me. Mm-hmm. I think Requiem's a great track. Um, yep. You know, I th- I just I think why it's placed where it is is it's really the first follow up record since In the Wake of Poseidon that um, isn't really anything new. Uh, mm-hmm. You can make the argument that it's a safer version of Discipline, I um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but there are some solid tracks on it, so that's I, I, that's why I have it where I do. Yeah, I I I pretty much agree with that sentiment. Um, you're number ten. Uh, nope, just kidding. Number nine. Beat. Also. Beat. Uh, okay. So it's, it's a little higher. Uh, same thing, I but I will say I do like it more than Three of a Perfect Pair. And um, I liked it, again, more than I thought I would. And there's a lot of there's a lot more tracks on that that I could say that I actually enjoy than something like Three of a Perfect Pair um, or the other ones mentioned. Uh, I think as an album, it's a bit more cohesive than the other ones that I've ranked. And that's kind of why... I uh, I put it where it was because I, I really feel like it held up more as an album than those other. The the B is really the first one I think on this list that feels like, you know, they were going they were going. It just feels like a cohesive album, I guess, is what I want to say. The other ones feel like they kind of took, you know, from different places and or like in the case of um, you know, through perfect pair, it they had a concept but it just didn't it didn't work too well. So I think Beat is the first one that really feels um, like a solid album to me. Because there's, there's a couple tracks on there that I'm not like huge on, but I don't really dislike any of the tracks either. I don't find it a chore to listen to, especially since most of the songs are pretty short. So it's, it's very digestible, you know. Definitely. Um, my number nine, and I can kind of see myself switching this with Beat, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so putting beat at number nine um but for now i i've kept beat at number 10 uh my number nine is the power to believe mm-hmm. and what's interesting about this record is um i'm not a fan of any of the songs that have vocals in it um mm-hmm. i think happy with i forget the whole title of that freaking mm-hmm. song um <laughs> I, I think there's some cool moments in that song i'm not really a fan of the usage of auto-tune with Adrian Blue's vocals. Mm-hmm. I think it works um, in certain spots. I, I do like it in, I think it's The Power to Believe 2. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's used throughout as different segues. And I think it's cool, but at the same time, it, 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 it to me, it does a disservice to Blue's vocals, mm-hmm. who I think is a fantastic singer. Not to mention that it just sounds dated as well. Mm-hmm. Um but the reason why this album is placed where it is is I think this record has amongst some of the uh, band's best instrumentals. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Electric, uh, Level 5, and Dangerous Curves, I think, can easily, easily compete with songs like Fracture, um, the other Lark songs. Mm-hmm. Um, Any of the set, like with a lot of that period of the band's um, instrumentals, I would agree. Yeah, very um, solid stuff. Some of the best instrumentals. So that that's what kind of for now why I put the power to believe um mm-hmm. above beat. I think beat has better songs overall than power to believe. Uh but you can't you can't ignore those instrumentals. It's among some of the band's best work. So mm-hmm. that's why I have a place where I do. Yeah. Uh your number eight. My number eight is Islands. Uh this so this mm-hmm. is where um for me, the list got harder and harder to rank because this is where I'm getting into the albums that I really like. Islands is a, a really good album. I, it's very a lot different than um, most of the other stuff. It's probably like their most mellow album. Um, and I don't know. I think there's just... It's one of the most unique albums that they've, um, that they've released, in my opinion. And it's also... I, pretty sure the only album it's one of those albums again where it's just like one lineup and that was the only thing they did like lizard right um yeah it's got this quality to it that i mean i've always been a fan of it since i the since i first heard it and uh it's hard to describe it's like like i said it's kind of like a more mellow kind of psychedelic king crimson and uh particularly like songs like islands and formentera lady i really like um it has a bit of an edge to it at times but uh i i don't know i just I think it's just honestly, I kind of wish it was higher, but 
the other albums above it, I really love too. So it was, it was, it just kind of got stuck in the middle here, you know, towards the lower middle. That's all I really have to say. <laughs> okay. Um, so my number eight is three of a perfect pair. Mm-hmm. And this one grew on me a little bit, specifically some in, um, individual tracks. Um, a song like Model Man um, has become probably my favorite track mm-hmm. off that record. Um, we we can't ignore just like beat some of the trashier songs like oh, yeah. Man of an o- with an Open Heart. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm st- I still have not my feelings have not changed about this song, uh, but like the title track, of course, is a great opener. Um, again. I, I 100% agree with you. Um, the sequence is not good, hence why we did our own sequence of mm-hmm. Three of Perfect Pair and B. Check that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, sequencing is not great, but I do, to some degree, admire um, both the blues side of the record and the trip side, because I think the blues side is some of his best songs um Mm -hmm. some of his best songwriting and while i don't necessarily think the frip tracks are some of you know his best compositions i do appreciate the level experimentation Uh, i'm thinking of tracks specifically such as nugs and uh dig me Mm -hmm. um definitely some proto industrial going on those tracks i really Um, like industry that's industry is a great song too um some of those tracks really kind of foreshadowed where the band was going with uh, with Thrax. So I think there are some definitely highs on this record, but Half I, the I do with this with that album is the sequencing. Um, but I was, again, I was just about to say that again that that that, that is the biggest issue um, with it is its sequencing. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's good enough where I have it in my placement. I have it mm-hmm. right about in the middle. Um, so it's it's I, I think all in all, it's still a pretty good record. I think all in all, it's just another brick in the wall. All in all, it's just another brick in the wall. Fuck you, you're number seven. <laughs> Thrack. Um, again. Thrack, okay. This one um, I wanted to put higher, but again, the albums that are above it are there for a reason. Uh, this, this is probably, for me, the album that I appreciate the most after having done this. And I can see this um, really moving up, potentially. And it was hard for me to pick between thrack and the album above it as far as like where i placed them but the other one just barely kind of nudged it out um but yeah thrack was is i think a really solid album actually but i think you mentioned when we were talking about it that it kind of it kind of wanes a little bit towards the end of the record but um which i would mm-hmm. i think agree with a little bit but i don't think it wanes in the way something like you know three of a perfect pair or, or some of the other ones on here do uh it doesn't get like it doesn't feel like you know, by the end of the album, I don't feel fatigued. <laughs> There's a couple low points, but it's still a really, really good album overall, I think. Nice. Um, so my number seven is Islands. And mm-hmm. the, thing with, the thing with Islands is you could make the argument in some cases it's one of their worst records. Mm-hmm. Um, however, um, what I like about it is the title track is one of the band's best songs uh one of their best compositions the songwriting is solid mm-hmm. um so that's part of i don't want to say the saving grace because i don't think it's a bad record i mean mm-hmm. it's my number seven um i you can't ignore the bass you just you can't i mean Bose is bass play i mean the fact that fripp had to teach him a, a bass guitar the more and more i listen to that record you you do hear it and that yeah. and that kind of does set it back for it um, that album being a, a better one, at least in my opinion. Um, I think, you know, a song like Foreman Terra Lady, it's cool. I love how mellow it is. I think I mentioned in that episode, it's like proto post rock, which mm-hmm. is an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think that track could have definitely been sliced in half a little bit. Yeah. Uh, a song like Sailor's Tale has grown on me. I mean, that's a song that is almost like pre-read definitely foreshadowed that era of the band um i think a song like ladies of the road i now hate more than i did initially <laughs> they're just trying to sound like led zeppelin and i, yeah, I hate that i really do um i've got some very mixed feelings about led zeppelin these days that you and i just recently spoke of but um i think it's a messy record i really do but the highs are definitely high and 
that's kind of what saves it for me and why I have it at my number seven. I do like that it's a very mellow record, and it's I wish cool we kind of got it. It's got a unique it vibe. It does. Because some, some I, of those things, some of those qualities you were talking about kind of hurt it, but also at the same time help it because it gives it, it, gives it a unique sound. You know? It almost makes me wish that we got another record like that, but just better, of course. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, there are, there are individual tracks that we could dive into that are on subsequent records that mm-hmm. definitely have that mellower vibe, but I... Um, yeah, I this is a side of the band that while it's a one-off thing, I for the most part really like it. Yeah, it's a, it's a solid album. Definitely. Uh your number 6, Power to Believe. The Power to Believe. Yep. Um, um my number 6, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm sorry. Right. Um you'll go into yours in a sec. Um my number 6 uh is Thrack, but talk about why you have Power to Believe at number 6. Uh I just have a kind of personal connection with this album as weird as that sounds and it's just that I kind of mm-hmm. like first of all there's a little bit of nostalgia goggles going on there but um I don't know I think it's a re- it's like it's my favorite album from that period of the band um I know you're not really a fan of um a lot of the songs with vocals but I actually really like all of them for the most part um you know the end of the album uh, is kind of drags a little bit a little bit after dangerous curves but I think it's a overall the album's a bit more solid than thrack and uh some of the songs on there are just fantastic. Like you said, the instrumentals like Electric and Dangerous Curves are really great. And uh, Level 5 is one of my absolute favorite King Crimson songs. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the auto-tune and his voice in some of the songs, but I think a song like um, uh, I, uh, yeah, Eyes Wide Open, that's a really, really great song. It's a beautiful song. Yeah, yeah. that's one of their best kind of lighter songs, I guess. And I also like songs like... Um, you know facts of life and uh and like that so i don't know i i that there's something about that album that does it for me i don't know what it is but <laughs> i just think it's got a cool unique sound and uh i don't know it's it's definitely on the higher you know on the higher end of the scale for me nice um so i have thrack as i mentioned at number six mm-hmm. and i also share the same opinion as you do Mm-hmm. Um, that out of all of these records, it is the one that I also have really come to appreciate the most. Um, it, like I said, it was hard uh, not to put that in this spot and power to believe underneath it. That's how much I'm enjoying it. I can honestly see it moving up a little more even. Yeah, I, um, and my opinion still hasn't changed with, um, you know, the record in the sense of, um, like you also mentioned, with uh, it, it does feel very bloated Mm-hmm. like uh, Three of a Perfect Pair. And while I, I I like it better than Three of a Perfect Pair, I do find myself more fatigued towards the second half of that album yeah. as opposed to Three of a Perfect Pair. And I think that's just because of the length of it. Yeah, It's a longer record, and I think that's why. And there are more instrumental, so I think that's why I kind of start to feel a little worn out towards the end. Mm-hmm. I do still plan on coming up with my own sequencing of it, but <laughs> this is another one where... The best songs really are the best songs. Oh, I mean, they are. Tracks like um, uh, Walking on Air at yep. one time, I think, are some of their best ballads. Totally showcase uh, not only Adrian Ballou's vocals, but uh, definitely on the lighter side of things, really show um, that the double trio concept really comes into fruition very well with those tracks. Oh, I completely agree with that. Yeah. A track like um, Dinosaur, while a little campy, um, is still just a killer track. Yep. And then again, the instrumentals, Vroom, Be Boom, Thrack. Um, Thrack are just line them up with classic King Crimson instrumentals because they deserve to be there. Yeah. Just some heavy heavy shit i mean up to that point a song like thrack easily the heaviest thing the band put out um it's just a fantastic album um, and it's nice hearing that um that you know i mean i know it's the double trio lineup but it's nice hearing the you know blue Bruford, tony levin fripp era do some really heavy stuff you know that absolutely more of that classic king crimson sound it's the, it's the only example where we get that you know <laughs> yeah absolutely um it's just it's all in all a great album i agree with you it's one that um out of all the other ones um i really grew to appreciate the most yes yeah it's it, it, like i said it it still has more potential for 
for me to move up in the ranks, I think. Definitely, I and I would agree with that. Uh, I could see it eventually ending up in my top five. But speaking of top five, uh, we're there. We're oh, we're we're we're, uh, we're at the final five. So this we is <laughs> this is we did it so far. <laughs> um, but tell us your number five. Um, I'm not going to talk much about this, but it's Lizard. <laughs> okay, and I love this album. Um, it's just like I said. I honestly think you just. I think. I can't really say anything else, but you either like it or you don't. I think it's a very layered album. It's very interesting, like, instrumentally. There's so much going on in the album for me, and I, I don't know, I just like it. I can understand, especially with um, Gordon Haskell's vocals, they're not for everybody. I do. I would agree that they're not the greatest, but I think he does ballads well. Like, uh, I really like Cadence and Cascade from... Um, uh wow when the wake of poseidon and the wake of poseidon, uh, lady yeah. of the dancing water he that's a really nice ballad on this on this uh record and he has a few moments in the actual track lizard that i really like his vocals but overall there's a lot going on musically in in the album and that's why i think i like it so much it's it's interesting and it's got that whimsical proggy fantasy thing going on which i always really love and i know that's not for everybody but it's just a personal taste for me Oh, and the album cover is probably one of the coolest album covers. It is definitely one of their coolest album yeah. <laughs> covers. I, I can't deny that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, so my number five is actually uh, In the Court of the Crimson King. Wow, look at you. So hear me out on this a little bit. Um, I don't want to go too into it, but um, all classic album genre-defining aside, mm-hmm. and while it is a great record... Um, I think we sometimes get, we let, you know, classic status records and nostalgia affect our judgment for how good the record really is. That's fair. Yeah, that's totally fair. And while I'm not saying it's a terrible record, because I'm I'm not, it's it's my number five. Yeah, it's top five is a big deal. Um, (laughs) Look, it's not their best record. It's not. Um, Just from a pure musical standpoint... They have tons of records that are better. They have tons of songs that are better. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, um, there's still something special about this first incarnation of the band for me. Mm -hmm. There's still something special about these songs. 21st Century Schizoi Man. um, I remember hearing that the first time and being like, what the hell is this? So imagine being someone in 1969 at that Hyde Park show, seeing the Rolling Stones, and then... This band coming out, this band King Crimson opening, and hearing that song and being on whatever those you know people were on, like, <laughs> come on, like it just like that yeah. had to have been a crazy experience. It must have blown minds, honestly. And and Epitaph is one of their best songs. It's a beautiful piece. Greg Lake nails it vocally. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter Sinfield's lyrics are just so good. Um, and then the title track, which is the closing track, is also fantastic. Mm -hmm. um it's an amazing record it really did change music at that time period um but it's not their best record hey that's fair i think that's totally fair in my opinion um so that's my number five um what's your number four larks tongues and aspic okay um one like again it's in the top five so at this point there's no there's no like i don't like you, you know it's not a bad album or anything it's just that you know, there's three other ones that I think are better. Uh, this is definitely a very high point in the 70s for me. Um, this is an album, again, this one also would probably be my other one that I think moved up for me because, um, to be honest, I wasn't as familiar with this album as maybe you'd think. Like, I've listened to it a bunch, but I, I never <clears throat> listened to it, like, like constantly, like some of the other albums on here. And, um, yeah, I mean, just tracks like, I mean... It, Larks 1 and 2, Exiles, um, you know, Easy Money, the tracks like, I, it's, it's, it's a, a fantastic record front to back. Uh, one of the best, as far as I'm concerned, like probably a really excellent example of, you know, the best of prog rock from that period, you know. Um, I don't know, I, I, I think it's really well done. And, and uh, like we talked about when we were, um, originally talking about the album it kind of marked the beginning of a new band and they really rang it in and you know in a big way as far as i'm concerned so 
Um, and yeah, even and even just Lark's one and two alone. I mean, those are two of the best tracks I think that um, King Crimson have ever done. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't disagree with a single thing you just said about it. Um, and <clears throat> if really that record, um, along with Court, um, is really important in their catalog. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, so <laughs> the, I'm seeing the humor in this because. Um, my number 13 is in your top five and <laughs> your number 13 is also in my top five. So my number four is Starless and Bible Starless Black. And Bible Black yeah. So hear me out on this again, especially putting this above in the Court of the Crimson King. Sequencing sucks on this record. Yeah. I'm going to deny that. Along with Thrak, this is another one that I am eventually planning on putting my own sequencing together. Mm-hmm. Um reason why i put it ahead of court is after just talking about the great deceiver box set what i love about this record is this really showed how kick-ass this band was live Mm -hmm. and while my opinion on a song like the mincer hasn't changed and i don't like that they included Mm -hmm. it on the record um this is another one the best is the best and even if not all of these tracks i would put in my top 10 top 20 Mm-hmm. From a compositional point of view, this record has their best songs. A song like Fracture, who Fripp has said himself is the most difficult song um, for him to play. And while there are some other instrumentals I like a little better, it's one of their best songs. A song like Trio is another example. A track that didn't make my top 20, but it is one of their best compositions. This record just really showcases how great of a band they were live and how great they were at improvising and a rock Mm -hmm. band to improvise. That's not something that was very heard of during this time and really not something that's very common today. But like Mm -hmm. this record just shows that this was a band, especially this lineup of the band that you could put against jazz fusion um bands you know you could put against you know like um jazz players like this record just showcases that but even some of the other songs like lament it's just a solid track yeah that Um, is a good good that is a really good the night watch is one that's grown on me um just lyrically some of um i might blanking out on his name james palmer Mm -hmm. you know who i'm talking about um great track lyrically so while the sequencing is not good on this record um i would argue that this is another important record in the band's career and that's why i have it where i do i think that i think all the stuff you said is fair i think like i said my issue is if you're looking at it from an album perspective it just doesn't it doesn't flow very well for me and 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 that i totally agree with issue with it i think i think they should have just given it a little bit more tender loving care when they were actually um putting it together and really thought of the sequencing <laughs> i don't know why that made me crack up tender <laughs> loving care. i think they i think it needed a bit more uh attention i, I don't know what the circumstances were of them recording it but it, it it sounds like it was rushed you know to me and i and and i agree and i i, I can't argue with that i i think um you're probably right on point with that um, and again but you're you're uh you're number three and I, I was gonna say real oh, quick, I'm sorry. just to end that. Uh, the there there is no such thing as a bad King Crimson record, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't think it's a bad album. It's just that, like I said, as far as a album itself is where I have the problem. As totally, as other than King, Lizard, there's no yeah. such thing as a bad King Crimson. <laughs> yeah, number three, you asked. I did. You, you didn't even appreciate my joke. <laughs> wow, I just I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> other than Lizard, you're right. There's no such thing. As, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I cry. Uh, all right you're number three go for it Uh, mine is discipline and it was very very tempting to put this at number two like it was really really difficult between the two and two and three and i'm still not sure i'm 100 percent satisfied with it it, that album is fantastic it's real like there isn't a track i don't like the only small qualm i have with it is maybe ending the album on two instrumentals i don't think they should have done that but regardless i love both of the instrumentals and some of their absolute best songs are on here. Frame by Frame, Mate Kudasai, Thelo and Ginji, you know. I mean, um, Indiscipline. It, it, again, was also another really important album for the band where it was the rebirth of King Crimson 
Um, and I think they just came in, you know, swinging. They they did a phenomenal job. Uh, it really it really is one of the best records and one of the most unique records of all time, as far as I'm concerned. So my number three is also discipline. Yeah. And I too was also tempted to put it by number two. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a record out of, out of any other King Crimson record. Every time I listen to it, I love it more and more and mm-hmm. more. Yep. Um, a song like The Sheltering Sky, which I was a little critical of um, mm-hmm. in episode three, is a track that's grown on me. Yep. I I was, s- remember I was telling you about that? I loved it. Did you watch the live version? You there? You cut off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I said... All uh, right. I said, um, uh, remember, did I, did you ever watch the live version? I, I still have not watched the okay, live version, but since <laughs> listening, yeah, please do. But since, um, going back and listening to it more and more, that track's grown on me. Mm-hmm. I still like discipline as far as the instrumentals better. Mm-hmm. And I do stand by, um, what I did say, um, that I do st- still feel putting those two tracks back to back on the, end of the record would still be my biggest complaint yep same um, here while i wouldn't remove either one of them from the record i would just maybe sequence one of them somewhere else yeah um, you, i think discipline or um even sheltering sky one of them could have been put at the end of say the first side of the record and agreed that would have been the perfect way to end the album but to like especially coming off of red years prior um talking about a radical change that worked and i mean just this is just i love just the uniqueness of you know a song like elephant talk with the lyrical mm-hmm. approach um frame by frame which might be the closest to new wave that they got in this era of the band it's just mm-hmm. such a great song with the vocal effects with tony 11 mm-hmm. and adrian blue in discipline um just with the spoken word and how it just builds it builds and builds both instrumentally and with um Adrian Blue's vocals, um, and another song like uh, Matsukuda Sai, um, which has gro- which I you know I was a song I liked, um, but has continued to grow on me. And it's just such yep. a beautiful track. It's just from start to finish. Other than having those two instrumentals back to back, an amazing record. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what's your number? What's your number two? Uh, it would be Court of the Crimson King. Um, okay. And like I know it's. I, look, I think a lot of what you said, to be honest, is valid. Um, but to me, Court of the Crimson King, aside from some of the Moonchild noodling at the end, um, had that been had that honestly been taken out, um, this might even be number one. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I I just love Court of the Crimson King. It's a classic album. Uh, like you said, it was it was genre defining. It was all those things. But uh, I still really, it's still one that I put on. In terms of their discography that i put on a you know what it's aside to, to actually ironically discipline might be the one that i listen to the most actually but uh court is one i always go back to and uh you know i i think if if just alone the album was an ep that was schizoid man epitaph and court of the crimson king it would be enough you know <laughs> but yeah could you we also have i talk to the wind i love that song um like I said, I love the first half of Moonchild. Uh, it's really great. Uh, the new, the noodling is where it falls apart just a little bit, but even so, I think it's a solid album. And um, I don't know. I, I still think this is one of the best lineups of the band too. I love Mike Giles, the drummer, and um, I love all the stuff that Ian McDon Ian McDonald does on the flute and the saxophone and uh, the mellotron. Uh, it's probably one of the best uses of a mellotron on a record, as far as I'm concerned. And it's got that old school prog feel, which, uh, I mean, you know, I love old 70s progressive rock. It's one of my favorite genres of music. So this it has this. And I, again, I love the the um, the whimsical lyrics at times. But also, you know, we even talked about this. I think um, this album has a lot more of those philosophical kind of lyrics. Like, I think Epitaph probably is the lyrically their best song. Um, I just love the stuff i would you know, I don't know. probably I just, have to agree with that i i just that to me is one of the greatest songs of all time and i don't know i i can't praise this record enough it's not my number one but i think it deserves to be at least in the top three or five so um cool i mean that's you know i, I can't really yeah. um argue with any of that yeah. um so my number two is red 
And I, I don't want to... Yeah, so my number two is red. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let's just God. Say, say that again. And look, I don't want to really get into it too much uh-huh. um, because, I mean, what more is there to say about it? Um, mm-hmm. I, it's probably their best record, mm-hmm. but it doesn't mean it's my favorite. And I'll talk about my favorite and why it's my favorite when we get to number one. Um, but I kind of do want to give just like a shout out to some of the lesser talked about tracks. Uh, a song like Fallen Angel, I think, is yep. such an amazing um, ballady track that has like these cool, you know, like ambient noises throughout. Um, we got to remember that this is also right around the same um, time period when Fripp was collaborating with Eno. Um, yep. So you really hear it on that track. A song like One More Red Nightmare is just such a heavy but funky track oh, that and just success. rips both on the vocals and the bass uh the I just, drums it's are actually a, the highlight of that song <laughs> yeah opinion. um just to, for sure um just such a killer track um i'm not going to get into um red and starless quite yet i want to save that for uh, my upcoming songs but mm-hmm. i mean look there's not really a whole lot to add to this record it's you know it definitely was a great way to close that era of the band i mean Mm -hmm. it definitely perfected what the wet and bruford cross from era of the band were doing but it was really just a great closing chapter from 69 to 74 all in all you hear you hear you know stuff that they did on the first couple of records um it's just and really there's there's not a whole lot to add that hasn't been said already um but still at my number two um i again agree with pretty much everything you said there except that my number one is red um and that's only because i think um first of all uh i think red is the perfect album length like the length of an album you know i mean it's it doesn't overstay its welcome and it's also not too short which some uh you know several of these other albums could qualify either or right um particularly on the long side of things i don't know i think i love every single track on this i don't think there's a weak track or a weak moment on this album uh at one point i would have said providence was that was that uh track but no i think i honestly again shout out to the stephen wilson remake uh, like remasters or remixes um gave me a new love for that track as well Uh, i love the darkness and the menacing sound to it the proto metal kind of sound um it's both like most of the tracks are uh um like you said tracks like fallen angel one more red nightmare uh red very musically and technically impressive but also you know they're kind of reasonable length songs that you know you could if somebody wanted to play them on the radio, just none of this shit ever gets played on the radio, but if anybody wanted to play it on the radio, it would, it would be fine. It wouldn't take up, you know, 15 minutes or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even a song like like Starless, it's like, what, eight or nine minutes long or something? It doesn't feel that long. It's a, um, it's an epic track. So I don't know. I just really love this album, and I, I, I often, like, debate back and forth with myself what my favorite King Crimson album is, and I... And it's usually between my top three, but I really think Red it has to be it. Um, it's it's arguably the best lineup of the band. Um, you know, they really were at their peak as far as I'm concerned musically on this one. And uh, yeah, I I hear something new every time I listen to it. And it's one of those albums that I just I don't listen to all the time because I think if I listen to it all the time, I'm going to ruin it, you know? I, it's kind of like, ooh, I'm going to treat myself to Red today, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, I think it's just a really phenomenal album, and I really think uh, in terms of that era of the band, it was their peak. And it, they, I really think everything they were working on um, at that time was to this record, and I think its legacy uh, really shows that as well. But I have a feeling you're going to disagree with me, so go ahead. <laughs> no, it's it, look. It's not that I disagree with you. Um, you know, as I just acknowledged myself, um, I'm not going to deny that Red is their best record. Yeah. Uh, but there's a difference between best and favorite, and sometimes the two don't always intertwine. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, my number one is uh, Lark's Tongues in Aspen. 
That's interesting. I honestly was expecting that your number one and number two were going to be reversed, so I want to hear this. So, as we were going through this series, this is the one I went back to more than any other. Mm -hmm. There are just certain records um, that take you in this place. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, some of those records are the Beach Boys Pet Sounds, which is my favorite album of all time. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, Miles Davis in A Silent Way, um, the Beatles' White Album and Abbey Road. um, uh, You know, that just really take me to this place when I listen to those records from start to finish. Mm -hmm. This one does that for me. Um, From the opening of Lark's Tongues all the way to part two at the end, and then everything in between. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lark's Tongues in Aspect Part 1, just right off the gate, the holy shit, new band. We're hearing violins now, um, Fripp's guitar is getting heavier than ever, Mm -hmm. Um, we've got this new drummer, but there's percussion going on too. I mean, like this song alone is like a classical piece of music. Mm-hmm. And then we go into a track like Exiles, which I stand is the band's best ballad track. Um, mm-hmm. Wet and just sounds great. The band are just in sync. Um, another song like Book of Saturdays is just so beautiful. I would put that from a lyrical point of view among the band's best up there with tracks like Epitaph. Um, mm-hmm. And then just the transition to um, the talking drum to Larks 2. And a track like Larks 2 maybe not technically as impressive as the first part, but it's just this eight-minute riff machine. And it's just, just a solid way to end the record. Oh, definitely. I think, I think the sequencing is perfect. Mm-hmm. And this is a band that's always been hit or miss with that on their record, sequencing. Um, and it's just well-balanced. I, I don't know what else to add other than that. I acknowledge that Red is probably, well, not probably, it is the better record. Um, and a song like Starless is kind of like a 12-minute version of what I'm saying about all of Lark's tongues. That mm-hmm. song takes me in this really special place, but all of Lark's tongues in Aspect um, does that for me as well. It's just, it's it's a beautiful record. It's a special record. Um, it gets bonus points for having probably my favorite album cover as well. Um, and, it is a yeah, really cool I, album cover. It is. And I, um, while it might not be their best, I just love the simplicity of it. And I think it just really yeah, represents I, I, I can't, the sound of the record too. I can't argue with Eric. Uh, like I said, I, Lark's really moved up the ranks for me too. Be, um, I really don't think, especially, again, Stephen Wilson, you beautiful man. Like these <laughs> remix uh Wilson remix made me hear the song Exiles for the first time, as far as I'm concerned. Agreed. Um, yeah. That was yeah, a song yeah, I uh, didn't like, appreciate prior. Yeah, th- uh Larks was a huge, huge uh um you know, it, it was a huge change for me, my perspective on that album. And uh it just um I, I again I, I can't disagree with anything you said either. <laughs> so I think <laughs> it gets to a point where it's like, okay, you know, you could be objective as you want. There's just personal opinion, you know, and, and some records do it more for you than they do me and vice versa, right? So Absolutely. So that was our album ranking, guys, our top 13, if you will. Um, let's do this, Rob, because I'm, I'm looking at time. I know. We always get in this pickle. <laughs> I know, but I'm, I'm, I'm determined. I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want to end... Um, where we said we were going to end. Okay. So let's let's like some, let's make some modifications a little bit. Okay. Let's do our top twenty next. Okay. Uh, let's try to keep our descriptions very brief, um, if really none. Um, and then maybe instead of doing a mutual top twenty, because I have a feeling we'll, <laughs> that alone will be here in another hour. Um, l- let's maybe bring it down to five or ten. Five or. How do you feel about that? Sure. Sure. Should we go with five or go with ten? Sure. And I have a proposal for you for, the, for how to rank our top five albums. Do you want to hear it? Go for it. Okay, this is what I think it should be. And you just say agree or disagree. I think it should be one, Red, 
two and larks. Saw, uh, albums. I'm sorry, albums. Our Go, albums, yeah. One, red. Two, larks. Three, discipline. Four, court. Five, threk. I think that is a good representation of both of our feelings because all in all, um, where you and I place Thrak is not too far off. Yep. Um, and those other four, I believe, are in our top five. So I'm good yeah. with it. And I felt and like it, I felt I'm good like with it in that order put, too. I, I felt like because you put Red as your number two, and it wasn't my number one, that naturally it should have been number one. Larks <laughs> was number four for me, but it was your favorite, so I felt like it deserved the number two spot. I was tempted to put Discipline there, but since we both put Discipline as three, it seemed like a safe spot for it. And then <laughs> um, Court just has to be in there, and I feel like Thrak deserves five just because I think for both of us it was the record that, uh, for, aside from me with Larks, I think it was the record that really kind of sh- outshone everything else. We seem know? to share the same opinion on it. We just yeah. had it, I think, slightly right. So I am I am good with that top five, and exactly in that order. Okay, cool. Sweet. So there you go, guys. There, That's that's our top five albums. Number five, Thrak. Number four, Court of the Crimson King. Number three, Discipline. Number two, Lark's Tongues and Aspic. Number one, Red. Boom. Awesome. So let's move on to our top 20 tracks. We'll do it which, the same way. Which we will do, do after your... I potty. After you potty. We're doing a potty break? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So you ready? Let's move on to our top 20 tracks. Oh man! So how do you want to do this one? Do we want to? Do you want to just go through? Um, so let's, do you let's want me to do, do my list and then you do your list, or? Um. How yeah, do we can do that. Why not? Go ahead. You do your list first, then I'll do mine. Okay. Are you ready for this then? I'm ready. It's gonna be a lot. I'm gonna go slowly, just so you can, so you can, you know, basically soak it all in. Soak it in. React. Yep, I got gotcha. you. Okay. okay. Number number twenty is electric off of the power to believe. Ooh. Number 19 is Circus from Lizard. Okay. Number 18 is Dinosaur from Thrak. Mm Mm-hmm. 17 is Fallen Angel from Red. 16 is Islands from Islands. 15 is The Sheltering Sky from Discipline. 14 is Cadence and Cascade from the... um, Wow. Blah, 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 blah. The, uh, wow. In the wake of Poseidon. In the wake of Poseidon. I, think of that. <laughs> I had power to believe in my head and I knew it wasn't right. Okay. Uh, number 13 is 21st Century Schizoid Man by, okay. or from Court. 12 is Red from Red. 11 is Frame by Frame from Discipline. 10 is Level 5. So we're in the top 10 now. Level, level 5 and number 10. Wow. Belief. Okay. Number 9 is Stella Humginji from Discipline. Mm-hmm. Number eight is the construction of light from the construction of light. Number eight, wow. Yep. Shit. Number seven, I cheated, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna admit that, and I don't care. I'm gonna keep the cheat. Number seven is Lark's part one and two. I could I'm not call, pick between. I'm gonna call two. bullshit on that. That even though I cheated in the original <laughs> episode, but all right, all right. <laughs> I just am cheating too. How'd you cheat? Oh, well, I guess we'll find out. Number six, six is Court of the Crimson King. Uh huh. Number five is top five now. Top number five is one more red nightmare. Ooh, number five for that. Okay, cool. Yep, I love that song. Number four is the entire piece, Lizard. Number okay. Number three is Mate Kudasai. From I know you love that song, but number three, wow. Okay. Yeah, it is. I think like upon you know hearing it, um, the album more and more. I really think that's my favorite track off that album. That's number great. two that's awesome. is Epitaph from Court of the Crimson King. And I'm going to let you guess what number one is. Starless. It's Starless from Red. So hold on. There's there. Okay. So before I, 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 I gotta, I gotta critique you a little bit. Okay. Please. Um, I, I want this. For, first of all, our lists are pretty different. So right. that's interesting. That's exactly what I wanted. Uh, but there are two and maybe one you said, and I just missed it, uh, but there are two. I'm, I'm, I, I got to point out that I'm like, are they not in your 20? Um, uh-huh. Did you say Islands? Islands is on there. It's number 16. So I missed it. Okay. Yeah. Um, no Indiscipline? I like that song a lot. Um, it was... Believe me, I had a top 30, and then I had to shave it off, <laughs> and it was really difficult to do that. Okay, um, fair enough. Now, uh, there's a couple of things that should be stated. First of all, my original interpretation of how we were going to do our top 20 was, just this is for the audience's sake here, was that we would try to have at least one album by everybody, by or one song from each album representative, right? So you said, no, that's a bunch of crap. 
It's your legit of throughout the entire career, your favorite. It doesn't matter if like one album has every track and the and you have some albums where there's no tracks. So I went off of that. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think that's valid. I mean, I think while you know I can understand wanting to include um, at least a track from all the records. Um, to me, that's not just uh, entirely representative of what truly is, you know, your your favorite. I mean, I will tell you that I think just looking at mine, there are three albums that num- not a single track are in my top. Point. Yeah, same here. I think there's three albums that yeah that I can think of that are not represented at all. So, yeah, uh, and it's also interesting because there's a couple of uh, albums that are pretty low on the list. Uh, that are even above other albums, or, or that are even below uh, at least one album that I can think of that has no representation, that have tracks, like The Construction of Light is in my top ten, but I would not put my <laughs> that as far as like one of their best albums. So, yeah, there you go. Hmm. Let's well, hear you it, go. Andy. Let's hear the top 20. I want to know. All right, Robbie, here's my, uh, here's my top 20. Um, right at number 20, 21st Century Schizoid Man. Nice. I'm glad it made your top 20. Yep. Um, just cracked number 20. Uh, number 19, this one was a grower for me. Uh, Mata Kudasai is my number 19. Nice. Uh, specifically that um, alternative version with Fripp's uh, overdub guitar in the beginning. Uh, my number 18 is Fallen Angel. Nice. My, That's funny. Mine's 17. So yes, I remember like that. Um, my number 17 was Fracture. I just want to quickly point out that with Fracture, I believe in the last episode, I said that I like Fractured better. Um, I digress. Fracture is the superior piece, in my opinion. Nice. Um, specifically the Stephen Wilson remix. Uh, my number 16 is Walking on Air. Nice. My number 15 is Bolero. Oh, the um, yeah, from Lizard? Mm-hmm. Nice. Glad to see some lizard representation. And the only you will get. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll take it. Um, my number 14 is Lark's Tongues in Aspect Part 2. Nice. My number 13 is Red. My wow, number... mine was, my, 12 was Red for me. Interesting. Yep. Uh, my number 12 is Easy Money. Cool. And my number 11 is One Time off of Thrak. Wow, nice. I was very tempted to... That was another one that was very close to the top 20, but just barely didn't make it. But That's just it might such a beautiful time. track. It really is. Um, so my number 10 is Neurotica. Wow, that's a, that one's surprising. I that's, love this 10. song. I, nice. It's kind of like the indiscipline off of, um, off of beat cool. in the sense, but I love the back and forth of the uh, spoken word and the um, uh, vocals. Um, so that's my number 10. Number nine is In the Court of the Crimson King. Yes. Num- there. Number eight is Lament. Cool. Uh, number seven is One More Red Nightmare. Yes. yes. Number six is Exiles. Cool. Number That's one that just barely missed it. Uh, mm. It was tough. Yeah. Uh, number five is Lark's Tongues in Aspect Part One. Nice. Number four is Epitaph. Number three is Indiscipline. Wow, you really love that song. <laughs> love it. Uh, number two is Islands. And number one, of course, is Starless. Well, I'm glad I glad to hear we both have the same number one, and I'm not surprised about Islands. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and do our... Did we agree we're going to do a top five? Let's just do a top five track. Let's do a top five. I think it goes without saying that number one is going to be Starless. Yeah, number one is definitely going to be Starless. I think Epitaph belongs up there too somewhere. I think Epitaph should be number two. You think so? Because I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I have it at number four, and it was in your top five as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that should be our number two. I think even though I have it at number 20, I almost feel like we're obligated to put Schizoid Man in the top five. I don't think so. No? Okay, well then, Because it wasn't it. in my top five either. I That's right. Okay, well then, fuck it. We're not putting it in the top five. To. This is our collective list. I think we need a Larks in there. So I will come to a compromise with you. Let's, for our number three, we'll cheat, and we'll put one and two together as our number three. I agree, because I cheated, and I don't care. <laughs> I, I don't care either, so there we go. 
So we've got Starless at number one. Um, we've got <sighs> Epitaph at number two. And then Large Tongues and Aspect Part 1 and 2 as number three. Yep. What about a four yep. and a five? I think we need something from Discipline. Hmm. But so I don't we know were, we we were kind of all there. over the place with Discipline. Yeah. We had some varying opinions. Like, frame by frame, just barely missed my list. Yeah, um, it was on mine. It was on. Uh, it was at number 11. The ones I have from Discipline are um, Frame by Frame, Thelahun Genji, oh, The Sheltering Sky, and Mate Kudasai. Jesus Christ, you've got half the record on there. Um, yeah, I love that album. I have Mate so Kudasai and, and Discipline in do you my wanna top 20. Do you want to do mate kudasai since it's the only one we both did or yeah i would honestly do frame by frame if you want to i mean frame by frame i think i would argue is more essential uh, um but mate kudasai is my favorite of the two and clearly yours yeah. too i mean why but, not have that oddball in there let's put mate kudasai in okay so we have then starless epitaph um we'll put larks one and two and we'll put Mate Kudasai. And since we have three, like, three of my top five in there, I think we should throw Islands in there. Because that is a phenomenal song, and I, I I, was tempted to put it higher. I'm, I'm down for that. So, here we and go. I think we should put Islands over Mate... Actually, I would even put Mate Kudasai over the two Larks. So, I, Ooh, I, I would I personally would not, go, I don't agree with that. No? Really? No I'm surprised. Way. Over the Larks? No. What's the Larks, by the way? <laughs> no. Over Larks? I, I disagree with that. Okay, so how would you like to sequence it then? Starless, Epitaph, Larks, Islands, Mate Kudasai. Perfect. There you go, guys. Number so there five. you have it, guys. And it, you know, I think it's a, I think it's a good, you know, the intention of doing the combined list. I'm sorry that it's not 20, as we originally mm -hmm. said, but I think what's cool about this top five that we just agreed on is you've got, you've got an essential, which is Starless, and that's a no-brainer yeah. that that song is their best song. Um, but putting the two Larks pieces, we're getting the instrumental side of the band. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting um, a classic being Epitaph, and then yep. two deep cuts. Quite frankly, uh, so well, I think so. You're getting you're getting the very like soft ballady side of King Crimson that you never really get with Islands. And Mate Kudasai is just a weird song. It's a it's it it represents the weird blue era. You know, oh, well, so. absolutely does. So there you go. Let's just cap it off one more time. Number five, we have Mata Kudasai. Number four, we have Islands. Number three, we have uh, Lark's Tongues and Aspect Part One and Two. Epitaph, Epitaph at number two, and then Starless at number one. I love it. I think I that's it a great list. Um, so you, sir, I believe have some questions you put together. We do, but I just very quickly want to give you my three top three growers. Yes, growers, 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 growers. Give me your top three. At number three, I have one time. <laughs> mm. That song will knock it out of my head, and I think that's a good thing. <laughs> the fact that that song, I'm tempted to put it at number two, actually, but I think, you know what? Yeah, it's it's between that and my number two is Fractured, like from Constructional Light. Yeah. That was another really one that just, like, I just want to hear it more and more, you know? And I love that alternate version, by the way, since we've recorded that episode uh, with Pat Mastelotto's, like, re-recorded drums. Fantastic. That oh, version amazing. is the definitive version, version, version as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then my number one is Exiles. Ooh, um, that nice. That was the biggest treat for me. And I, all three of these I really wanted to put in the top... 20 but there's a lot of these songs that i've just been a big fan of for a long time and it was hard not to include them you know nice so, so I, um, I i approached my top three growers a little differently in that mm -hmm. two of them initially i thought were just okay mm -hmm. and the number one was one i was very vocal about um mm -hmm. but has since become a major grower um so i have number three the night watch <clears throat> excuse me off of starless and bible black mm -hmm. um, wow I kind of talked about already why that one's grown on me, so I'm not gonna, you know, uh, get into that again. But I definitely, I think that's a good song. Uh, my number two is Model Man off of Three of a Perfect Pair. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you said one time has been stuck in your head. This has been the one for me that's been stuck in my head. <laughs> I love the falsetto and blues vocals. It's catchy. It's upbeat. Um, I, I just think it's a good song. Um, so that one really grew on me, 
and it, it made my cut for uh, our perfect beat sequencing. I think that's mm-hmm. when that song grew on me. Um, and then my number one, believe it or not, is cat food. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a feeling you would laugh your ass off. So um, <laughs> I love I, how much shit you talked about that song, and now it's your like number one grower. Yeah, I mean, like, look, I, the lyrics are still silly. I, yeah, I get bad. that there is a deeper meaning to them. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Model Man, I just find myself singing this damn song. And I do stand okay. by what I originally said, that instrumentally, it's a fucking kick-ass song. It it's is, got a honestly. groove to it. It's yeah. It just, yeah. I, I, so I've kind of I've warmed up to it a little more. Um, I, I clearly not in my top twenty, um, but a song that I've added to my personal King Crimson mix. So nice. it definitely grew on me. So I've I've cooled off on it. A and we should bit. say with those, I this could have easily been a top fifty for me. It was very difficult. To, uh, I wouldn't go that far um, for me personally, but uh, probably top thirty. Mm-hmm. It was, um, I had originally had a top 30 and it was hard to cut it down so I think I probably could have honestly gone up to 50 or at least 40 yeah all, all right, right. so uh, let's let's ask away some questions so you came up with some questions that I'm very intrigued because I <laughs> don't that they'll be I'll be hearing them for the first time as well so take it oh, away guys, my we're man. try to get through these quick for the sake of time and uh, it's just five simple questions about just Overall, this whole experience of doing this podcast and doing um, the, uh, you know, focusing on this band and diving so deep with the band. So we'll both, we both will kind of answer them. Let's try to have brief answers and then uh, it's just meant to be simple questions here. So number one, and you can answer this first. What was the biggest surprise for you after going through the band's whole career? The biggest surprise after going through the whole band's yeah. career? Mm-hmm. Uh, Oh god, man! I gotta be quick with these answers. Uh, biggest surprise is the uh, the consistency of the quality of music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very fair statement. I would agree. Um, it doesn't really it doesn't really wane at too much at any point, does it? No, I mean we talked about sequencing and things like that, but overall, as far as mm-hmm. if we're just speaking on behalf of the music itself the quality was consistent from court to power to believe i completely agree um and you could tell that this is a band that evolved and did it well for the most part um absolutely for me i'm trying to think what my biggest surprise was from doing this whole thing um i think I think I was surprised how much we agreed. <laughs> I know that's silly, but we used to, people don't know this, but we used to get in heavy debates back in the day about music. Uh, we were also like pretty young. We were like teenagers discovering bands. And uh, it seems like, although we definitely have a lot of differences in opinion on a lot of these albums um, and these songs, it, we've been s- very, very on the same page, it seems like, with this band. Yeah, for the most part. Um, you know, I, it, it's it's just really interesting to me. Uh, I thought we're, there would be more tension and more, you know, uh, controversy, but it's been pretty much. Which I might say I'm a little disappointed with, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the most controversy we probably had was this episode in that the ranking of our uh, albums and song choices as well. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And even so, I could kind of see where you were coming from with all your stuff. So. Yeah. And, and all right. Uh, Sam. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I just was agreeing. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, all right, number two. Um, what song or album stand out to stand out the most to you now? Stand out the most to me now versus versus they... before we did this. Like, what, what, what now do you think stands out to you? Like, of all um, the albums. Okay, okay. Um, Not necessarily your favorite, but like what that like, stood um, out. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So we talked about a lot about these Stephen Wilson remixes. Mm-hmm. Um, a classic example would be a song like Exiles on yep. the, the 30th anniversary editions. Um, yeah. That was not a song that I would have been talking about as much, but um, just with the 40th mix, um, it just really comes into fruition a lot more. And I agree. Um, that's that's one for me that stands out. Um, I'm trying to think of one more. Um, I would probably say... Walking on Air would be another one for me as well, too. That was a great track, yes. Walking on Air. Yeah. Very good. Um, as far as songs go, I agree with you with Exiles. Um, 
there was definitely one. And there's actually a few on um, some of the other, like even a song like Trio. I mean, I'm, I'll give a little bit of uh, credit where it's due with Starless and Bible Black. I still liked the album and I, I felt like overall, like, yeah, the album doesn't completely work for me, but I like it a lot more after hearing the Stephen Wilson remixes than I did beforehand. It, it like certain tracks like Trio and you said uh, Lament and a few others were really really good. As far as albums go, I'd say honestly it's Thrack is the one that lastingly is with me and yeah. actually Beat surprisingly. I, I would agree with both like of those. Beat Thrack especially I I would. of course. Yeah. And I still can't get over because you mentioned Trio. Um, I still can't get over that Bill Bruford still received a writing credit because I know. He, he felt that um, it wasn't <laughs> necessary. To... When I heard that, I was like, "That's great." Yeah, to play the drums, so he still got a credit for that. So that that still cracks me up. Um, but okay, I, I um, agree with that um, with uh, Trio especially. Oh, definitely. Number three. What song or album are you most disappointed by now? song or album song or album or you could do one of each if you want okay um album i'm just gonna go ahead and say lizard i'm mm-hmm. um, definitely That's not fair. disappointed um just because upon doing this and doing my research um being a big jazz guy myself uh, there was a lot of excitement um mm-hmm when listening to that record. So, you know, to be a little disappointed when you were looking forward to something, um, Mm -hmm. it's a little bit of a bummer. So I would probably say Lizard as far as album goes. Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as song goes, (sighs) honestly, (laughs) this is going to sound stupid, um, but honestly, Prozac Blues. Um, For starters, seeing that title, I'm like, hey, that's kind of a cool song title. So... Of course, it's got to be a cool song, right? Nope. <laughs> Stupid logic at its best, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but also, just when we were researching for you know that episode, um, hearing supposedly that that influence with the, the distorted vocals, um, supposedly um, there was some Tom Waits influence, and uh, I'm, a, okay. I'm a big Tom Waits guy, um, so that also kind of got me excited. Um, like, oh, Adrian Ballou projecting, you know, Tom Waits. That's really cool. And whether that's the case or not, um, <laughs> the execution could have been, you know, any worse. <laughs> oh, yeah, I understand. What about For me, you? I would say it's probably three of a perfect pair. Okay. And that's because I thought I was going to really like that album. And it's kind of like, meh. You know, it's like, it, it's, it's not bad, but it's just, um, again, I think the sequencing is the big problem with it. And um, I can't really think of a specific song, to be honest. But definitely, for me, it's probably three of a perfect pair. And I actually do think, um, while I, you you know, Starless is probably still my least favorite album, uh, I did like it more, actually, after hearing the Stephen Wilson remix, as I said. So nice. uh, that actually doesn't qualify. I think that actually, um, you know, actually benefited well from this. So Cool. Um, uh, that was question three, so question four. No, I think that was question four. Four. Just kidding, it was question four. Oh, no, no, actually, sorry, that was question three. Just question kidding, four. it was question Has four. your overall opinion of the band changed, and if so, how? Um, has my overall opinion of the band changed? Um, not really. I don't think my overall opinion has changed, as opposed to that I, I now have a deeper understanding of the mm-hmm. band. And I'm not talking about deeper understanding in terms of just the history of like, you know, the different incarnations of the band, blah, blah, blah. Anybody can mm-hmm. go on Wikipedia and read about that stuff. I, why I think I have a deeper understanding is just like what King Crimson really was, it still is. I mean, I think, mm-hmm. and I'm paraphrasing, but, um, you know, Fripp had said something along the lines of uh, King Crimson is like, uh, what is it? Um, a way of doing things. A way of doing things, thank you. Yep. And, and that's definitely true. <laughs> I now, going through this catalog thoroughly with you, understand what he means by that. Yep. I totally agree. And I, I honestly don't think I could say it better, because I was just going to say I just appreciate the band more. They're definitely, you know, and I appreciate certain albums more. And um, again, um, you know, hearing those Stephen Wilson remixes and, um, hearing some of these albums really for the first time, it uh, 
it really put in it gave me a wider perspective of their whole career and discography absolutely and the final question is <clears throat> what did we not cover slash didn't cover enough that you would like to go over at a later date and that's the last question while i think it's definitely an endeavor in of itself as we've expressed and mm-hmm. We, I definitely need a break <laughs> from King Crimson, especially since Me I'm too. really excited about the next series that we're going to do. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think I still really would like to dive into um, side projects. Um, yep. Whether we just did like a top five of our favorite, but there's some gems there. I mean, the Fripp and Eno stuff is fantastic. And, you know, I've always wanted to listen to the Robert Fripp and David Sylveon stuff. I think he's yep. from the band Japan. Fukunino, um, and um, there's the, you know, uh, there's his solo stuff. Um, Exposure is a record I've yet to listen yep. to. Uh, some there's of the projects, projects and stuff I'd like to dive into more. So that's that's something I, um, well, I think we might have originally said we were going to do. Um, I would mm-hmm. still like to, um, you know, dive into down the road. Yeah, maybe uh, revisit those someday. As well as maybe even doing like, like the five best live King Crimson albums or something. Yeah, you know, I think kind of I think that could be a lot of fun too. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think that's what I would say. Doing, uh, looking into some of the side projects and even some of Adrian Ballou's stuff. He's got some solo stuff and a few other things. But yeah, I I would say that with the live albums would probably be where we want to go if someday we ever do another King Crimson series, which probably won't be for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, dude. So, wow. I, it's again, like it's it's bittersweet that we're wrapping. It is this bittersweet. Up. Um, yeah, I can't believe we're done. King Crimson's done. We've been working on this for literally months now. It's check been quite a journey. So, yep. do we want to reveal the next artist? Well, we before we reveal, and I'm going to let you reveal the next artist. We initially announced that it is a band, and that is now no longer the case so oops spoiler alert um we have talked about it and we've gone through three different options action actually and by the way all three of those will eventually do Mm -hmm. but we decided to go with a solo artist who is none other than david bowie mr david bowie so we're gonna go through all of his albums (laughs) (laughs) the way you said that you didn't sound too excited even though i know that's not true punishment (laughs) Um, look, I'm actually I, really stoked because I love David Bowie and every album of his that I've heard I've really liked and there's a bunch I haven't heard so I'm interested to hear literally for the first time a good chunk of his discography. So, I think if I can just briefly talk about why I'm excited going through mm-hmm. the David Bowie discography Go next it. is we said constantly going through King Crimson that King Crimson for you and me we're both just a band we mutually love. Yep. Growing up with you, you've always been a Bowie guy, specifically uh, early Bowie. Bowie. I kind of if, hopped. I, Bowie, so, if I could say, is one of the like four or five artists that got me into music. So go ahead. Sorry. I hopped on the Bowie train when I was a little older, specifically mm-hmm. early college. So we're talking 2012, 2013, mm-hmm. right around the time the next day came out, actually. Um, Fast forward to, you know, this time now, 2019, um, Bowie's my guy. Bowie is in my, <clears throat> excuse me, top three favorite artists. Um, oh, yeah, so I'm. Him. this is really going to be the first time that you and I talk in-depth Bowie. I'm but also I'm excited about that. I'm really That's looking good. forward to your opinion on the later stuff because mm. I think his, his third – half of his career if you will third half i just realized that did not make sense but the (laughs) part three of his career i think is a little (laughs) misunderstood um and there are some great gems there so i'm interested to hear your opinion when we do get to that um i only um know one of his albums from that period really well and i really like it so um, so, the, so I'm looking forward to that. That's that's my point. Is I'm looking forward to hearing your take I'm on them. I'm looking forward to it too because there's a lot of. I'm a huge fan of classic Bowie, so I'm curious to see what your opinion is on some of the, especially early records and like the glam era. That that's kind of my Bowie a little bit. But I I do recall the only thing I remember ever talking to you about with Bowie was 
Ziggy Stardust. And for some reason, I always remember you saying that the song Five Years is like the best opening track in an album ever. And my opinion has not changed. <laughs> okay, you're <laughs> good, yeah, good as to know far that, as that good goes. Good to know that your your opinion hasn't changed because um, I for some reason remember that. <laughs> I think there there will. What I'm also excited for is I think there's going to be more controversy because I know you're a big fan of the glam era. For me, mm-hmm. my Bowie is seventy six to eighty, so I can't wait to yeah. um, talk about that. Potentially hash that out. I will say the only thing that sucks is we got to start with his first record, which is just pure trash. But <laughs> I've only heard it once, so I can't really even say that. Um, I, but not, not Space Oddity. There's one just no, called yeah, the, 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 yeah. the yeah, self-titled David Bowie. Uh, yep. But we'll, we'll get into that, um, which will be our first episode. But um, the other thing, guys, too, we mentioned um, with the past couple Crimson episodes that we are, mm-hmm. are going to change the format. Um, yes. We're looking to use a different type of software that hopefully will make um, recording and editing easier for both of us since we live yep. in two different states. Um, but also we are shortening the content as well too. Yep. Uh, it's, they're going to be shorter episodes. A goal you guys know if you've been following us since episode one of Crimson that Rob and I can talk and we will just drift off. But oh yeah, we by, drift off a lot. <laughs> by hopefully just sticking to one album per episode. The goal is to keep the episodes 35, 45 minutes. Yeah, at like our tops. Like, our like tops. Our tops. Except for the only exception to that rule might be an episode like this, the Roundup episode. The Roundup we'll, episode and probably the first episode. Yeah, but the first, the, the idea is to do, do it one album at a time. It's going to take a while. But I think, first of all, it also, uh, all the things you just mentioned, but also... It gives us more time to really digest the albums instead of trying to cram, say, three albums into a two-week period or whatever we try to do. We only have to cram one album, so and then it makes it a lot easier for us and our wonderful significant others who put up with us uh, <laughs> to be able to talk for about an hour, you know, rather than like two and a half. <laughs> yeah. Um. So stay tuned for that. Um, yeah, the other yeah. thing, too, is we're really, guys, we're really going to try our very hardest to stick to the two-week format. Yes. Um, and which we're will also be... looking to branch out to other platforms as well, so we'll see how that goes. And, and there'll be more on that um, when we debut the first David Bowie episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but the goal is to stay two weeks. Uh, we've established a recording time and day. Mm-hmm. Um, we just got to discuss when that first day is. But once we start episode one of Bowie... Um, the goal is to really maintain that two-week schedule. And I don't know about you, but I hope we can get to a point soon where we can start implementing our other ideas. So aside from the discography discussion format, like yeah, we've I would been love mentioning that some of the other things. We've been mentioning that throughout the Crimson series, and we yeah. have t- quite a few other ideas that we've discussed. Um, unfortunately, they haven't gone any further than discussion, but that we really mm-hmm. do. Um, want to try as well we do want to branch out as much as we love the discography series um there are other things some of which are a little simpler to put together um that we do want to branch out to as well so stay tuned for that as well hopefully we'll dive into some of those other ideas um as long as the Mm -hmm. um software side of things um that transaction goes well so you know just hang tight guys but we do there are other things that we want to do and uh but I'm really excited to go through David Bowie's discography with you. Um, Me too. I'm I'm stoked. And there's a lot of connections between him and King Crimson, so it's kind of an interesting little transition to make. Absolutely, so and, I, and it's it's a great transition because uh, Frippo Pants, um, there will be some involvement with him throughout the career, and uh, really just talking about Bowie because Bowie really um, has a special place in my heart. Um, oh, what his a music the guy, and, and the man himself. Oh. So, and he's had so many different musicians play with him that it'll be fun to talk about that too. It will be. So, so the feels will get real, guys. Mm-hmm. Heads up. But uh, on the next episode of Sound of Music, <laughs> Dragon Ball Z, Sorry. Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Uh, but on that note, guys, um, King Crimson, for tuning in. Check out, <clears throat> check out our top mutual five tracks. Check out those top five records we agreed on because they're a great starting point and uh 
check out there will a be, perfect beat <laughs> there will be links in the description to all beat of our spotify playlists that you can check out um you'll my top 20 will be there andrew's top 20 will be there uh the perfect beat stuff for both of us will be there and what the hell i'll even make a top our top five list why not so awesome. all that stuff will be in the description you can listen to everything and let us know your thoughts did we screw everything up or which you never want to listen to king we Prince probably did <laughs> <laughs> let's be let's be real we probably did but um, i'll tell you one thing that i would love to hear at some point would be somebody who has very little or no experience with the band um listening to um say the albums that we were talking about or listening to our like essential king crimson um lists and seeing what you know, or playlists and seeing what their thoughts were yeah, i think I'd that would be, really be a lot of fun <laughs> be cool to bring them on as like a guest and talk to him about it that'd be a really neat idea but um but anyway i think that's it um yeah i've got nothing else i'm gonna be honest with you I'm hungry. I'm approaching hangry, so I think that's that's <laughs> probably our cue, guys. But uh, alrighty. Thanks till next time. For Thanks for in. listening. Um, thank you for the viewership. Uh, we yep. didn't think that it was gonna, you know, we were going to attain uh, that many viewers as quickly. So that's really awesome, exactly. guys. Hang tight for Bowie and uh, for more future content. But uh, for now, sayonara. See you later. Peace. Bye bye.